Let me first ask you about the overriding trend that Eric was just outlining. We don't have this avalanche into fixed income ETFs um, that we've been seeing for pretty much the entire year so far. Why do you think that is? So I think that's a couple of things. The, uh, the well, the primary one being the Treasury's issuing about 200 uh, was it 299 billion bills a week, gross about uh, 70 billion net at five and a half percent. So you think about it, you functionally can sit in cash at five and a half, you know, or you go to the long end of the yield curve and get less than four, and you got to take you know very long interest rate, very long duration, very long interest rate sensitivity. I mean, these cash levels are uh, are pretty high and some people say gosh I'll take that we'll talk about you know can you get yield in fixed income you can but boy you know if you if you carry at five and a half or you build a portfolio today that gets you some income and then go in a, you know there, there's a good chunk of the equity market that's below the average multiple so you know if you're filling out your investment portfolio card today and you say gosh what am I going to do uh, I gosh I'll carry high and then I'll buy some equities that have some upside and that that works pretty well. And I do love that you talk about equities, even as a bond guy, but I want to stick to the bonds <laughs> right now because if you look at the bond market in ETFs broken down by maturity, it caught my eye that for the past two months, you've seen a lot of money come out of short duration funds. So those in maturing in a year to three years, but then you take a look at ultra short and it's still holding on to all of those assets that it's taken in so far this year. What is it about the short space that people are getting out of right now? So, so first of all, you know, you've got an inverted curve, and today, functionally sitting in cash or cash, like I know, I've, I've, I think I said it on the show we did the other day, that you can own commercial paper, that six-month, nine-month commercial paper, and clip over six yield, which is pretty incredible. As you think about, if you're, gosh, I could do that, maybe I'll own parts of the high yield market and get, or parts of EM and get higher numbers, eight, nine, ten, and so to sit in some with an inverted curve, to sit in some of these areas that are not paying you a lot doesn't make a doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, so I'm sure there's some of the di that dynamic at play today. I want to say I mean you look at so I got no, so, well, well Rick I wanted you mentioned the inverted curve and I've just been kind of obsessing over this um, for the last few hours and of course this year we've all been watching that <laughs> now. Uh, the reason I've been thinking about it, Ed Yardeni um, thinks he has an explanation for the incredible inversion we've seen. I mean, three months, 10 year, over 100 basis point, 150 basis points, right? Um, and everyone's saying, does, does that mean a recession's coming? Or what, what is it signaling? Because the economy, the real economy data that we have looks very good. So Yardeni says, maybe the inversion of the yield curve just means that inflation is coming down at a rapid pace and not necessarily flagging a recession as it has the last, you know, seven times. What's your take on that debate. So I, I think the inversion of the yield curve is a good indicator of recession, but it's been wrong. I think it's like it predicted nine of the last three recessions. I, I, I don't think it's a great. I don't think it is a great indicator. And you think about what's happening today. You used to have an economy that was very interest rate sensitive. The economy today is not interest rate sensitive. The companies that borrow for CapEx, or some, sorry, the companies that spend on CapEx, that you think about the big tech companies that are spending on AI, or the, the Googles, Microsoft, the Apples, they don't really borrow, they use free cash flow. People have already locked in their mortgages at three, three and a half. So you don't have interest rate sensitivity there. The, the, the economy is just not, and you think about all the hiring in the economy, healthcare, education, these are not interest sensitive dynamics. So what happens is the Fed lifts the front end of the yield curve up and you don't create that much of, a, of an impact. But like you say, inflation is coming down. So you create this inversion in an economy that's actually resistant to or less sensitive to interest rate hikes. And so it's not, I would argue, it's not a good indicator at, at at all. And speaking of indicators, I read an interview with you uh, from a couple of weeks ago. You talked about you'd pay a lot less attention to surveys, where it's people's opinions about what's going to happen. You'd much rather read earnings reports. And so we have a lot of earnings uh, coming up. I'm just curious what you're looking for uh, in the next couple of weeks there. Yeah, I mean, I, by the way, I find some of these surveys where they poll 500 people, they're similar <laughs> to election polls. Like, people talk about what they feel like, and then actually, they could be in a bad mood, but they keep spending. <laughs> so I, I don't find these surveys terribly robust. And then it just swings like everything else with some of them. What am I looking for? I'm looking for a top line. I'm looking for what are revenues on a top line basis in an economy that's operating pretty well. But I'm also looking at there's real dispersion 
in, uh, in some of these companies today. So you look at some of the retailers, apparel, electronics, furniture that have been struggling a bit. But gosh, and then you look at travel, it's operating really, really well. The airlines, the cruise lines, the hotels. So I'm looking at dispersion. And then, quite frankly, you know, one of the things that around, you know, tech mm -hmm. drives so much today is how what's happening with search, what's happening with advertising spend. And those are going to be those are going to be pretty, uh, pretty important numbers to look at today. But I, but I'm pretty keyed in on a top line revenue mm -hmm. and our company is able to keep their margins at a reasonably stable level given some of the input costs have gone up. Well, Rick, it's going to be a really interesting week for you because I believe we have 165 companies in the S&P 500 reporting this week. We don't have too much time with you before the break. You're sticking with us. But before we go to commercial, I do want to ask about your thoughts on high yield credit because it's not lost on me that junk has been really performing well this year. Then you take a look at the flows. You've had nearly $6 billion leave from junk ETFs, whereas fixed income ETFs overall have taken in over $100 billion. Why does no one want to buy into this junk rally? So a couple of things. One, I mean, you can get yield in a, in a bunch of other places. We talked about EM. We talked about some of the quality yields you can get that are that are pretty attractive today. And you know, the, quite frankly, part of high yield today, if you're doing it on a in a passive way. Half the index trades at tighter than 300 spread and half trades above 800. So you're getting a lot of tight stuff and you're getting a lot of what I would argue companies that are under some stress. Part of why you know we're doing this in our ETF is being selective around the names that are actually paying you for the risk. That makes a lot of sense. And then the other side of it is if you're using beta in your portfolio, equities are doing a whole lot for you in terms of using that beta bucket. If you can get income in other ways and safer ways, then you know that's what I was saying. If you fill out your investment portfolio card, a lot of safe carry and then get the beta that's really working for you has uh, made a ton of sense.